Welcome back to Gano Control Podcast. I am your host, Ronick. And before I introduce my special guest today, I want to give a special thank you to our sponsors that made this episode possible. Mayfresh Shop. Mayfresh Shop is a graffiti shop that offers high quality graffiti supplies, art supplies, and custom airbrush. So make sure to check them out at Mayfresh Shop. Also, I want to give a shout out to our official sponsor, Spray Can Sponsor here at Gano Control Podcast, 360 Spray Paint. 360 Spray Paint is manufactured and distributed out of Mexico and the aim to offer high quality spray paint to all spray paint enthusiasts. So make sure to check them out at 360 Spray Paint. And with that being said, let me introduce my special guest today, Meeks. How are you doing today, brother? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. Always. I want to start by saying thank you for giving me a little bit of your time today to talk about your history and your contribution to the graffiti culture. Also in this rainy day. <laughs> yeah, it's very rainy. So let's jump right into this, brother. For those that this will be the first time to hear of Meeks, can you speak a little bit about how was it growing up for Meeks as a child and what is home to you? Well, uh, I was born in Philadelphia okay. and I moved from Philadelphia when I was six to uh, Orange County. Okay. And we landed Anaheim, Santa Ana area. Yeah. And, you know, it was kind of a culture shock because... It's a huge difference it, being from there and coming to LA okay. new and, <laughs> and experiencing a bunch of new things like gang banging and, yeah. you know, the whole culture of, of like the street culture, especially was a lot different than it was on the East coast. So it took a little bit of getting used to, but yeah. you know, there was still like b-boying and graffiti and stuff going on that, you know, I saw right away and gravitated to and like, hooked up with other people, like-minded people. And, okay. you know, we started little crews and had little dance crews. And and this is when you came to Orange County or? Yeah, when okay. I came to Orange County. Yeah, like uh, Anaheim, Santa Ana area. Okay. Yeah. So what do you think you would call home more, Santa Ana or Anaheim? I think Santa Ana because okay. I spent so much time in Santa Ana. Yeah. And like, you know, like making friends, friendships there. And, uh, you know, but the two cities are very close. So, yeah. you know, a lot of friends came from both areas. Being a young child, right, how was that transition, like the emotion going to like, damn, I'm leaving Philadelphia and I got to go to a whole new world out there. I don't know what to expect. How was that? I mean, of course, you're fearful because, you yeah. know, everything's new. But, you know, there's also the, the weather difference. Okay. It's, it's so much better weather here. So, yeah, we were excited to be here for that. And, you know, it's just like two different worlds, you know. Gotcha. So it was, it was a good experience. And now that we move a little bit forward, yeah. what do you feel gravitated you to start becoming creative in your own way? Both of my parents are creatives. Okay. My father is a musician. Okay. My mother is a fine artist. Yeah. And so like our whole lives, they're, they're hippies. So okay. they're very free, free thinkers. Yeah. And we'd always been exposed to art. They took us, to, they took us, took me when, uh, when I was the only child first. Okay. Before my sisters were born. <laughs> they took me to a lot of like museums and, and art shows. And we were allowed, we were allowed to be around a lot of like artists and creatives our okay. whole lives. So, you know, they, they, they promoted that in our life. So I think I gravitated to visual arts like right away and Definitely. Like had always been drawing and, yeah. and experimenting with paint and stuff. So, and did you have a artist in particular that kind of, that you kind of see in the world like damn that's cool maybe i could be that well i think like the first sort of influences for me my mother used to work in a in a a movie uh movie theater okay so she, at a very young age yeah she didn't have really a babysitter so i would sit in the theater and watch movies while she was working oh, okay until she got off work sometimes oh so you got to see all the exclusives first <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i think i think watching sergeant peppers the animated a movie, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's like early 70s stuff. Very little. I think I saw that probably six times in a row. Okay. And if you've seen the visuals in that movie, it's very psychedelic and very colorful and very like Peter Max inspired. Okay. It's another artist that like was around in that era. Yeah. A lot of those themes are like similar themes in graffiti. So I think those foundations sort of like pay, paid the way for me to like gravitate to that style of art. Okay. And, you know, you're, you're at the theaters, you're watching the movies, and you're kind of looking at this stuff, right? Then that's pretty cool. Maybe I want to get into this. Right. And at what point do you tell yourself, 
art is something I want to pursue before you got into graffiti? Mm, I think it's a long road. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, uh, being a creative is not always like the, the most rewarding uh, yeah. way of life. So it, it, it's a lot of challenges. Definitely. And, and like trying to make your way through life and like make a living at the same time was yeah. really difficult. So uh, like the conscious decision where I was like art is away for me. Yeah. Probably didn't come until I was like 18, okay. 17, 18. And, and along the road, were your parents um, supportive of you pursuing art? Or oh, was yeah. it, it kind of like, hey, man, you don't want to do that? No, no. Like I said, they're like free thinkers yeah. and, and creatives themselves. So they, they understood that like it was in me from, from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, like kind of like I'm born to be an artist. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and also like my other siblings, they're all creatives as well oh, okay. so it's it's like it made sense for us to like go into creative passions definitely so what would you say <clears throat> caught your attention when it came to graffiti being in santa ana well i think pre santa ana i mean being from the east coast yeah graffiti was everywhere already so okay. like on the trains like in in like the, the the subway systems and just in the in the city in general yeah like it was always something that caught your eye and if it was bright and poppy and like even just like the tags okay like i just started like it all started registering for me like oh people actually do this yeah. like you don't really see people doing it okay but you know that people do it and it's not allowed so it's sort of like it's sort of like inspiring and also just sort of like a mystery that you kind of want to solve like oh like that's crazy who who are these people that do this what when do they do it or what yeah what are they how are they (laughs) how are they getting away with this stuff yeah so i think that like that accompanied with like my parents sort of outsider way of living okay sort of like i i gravitated to things that like maybe weren't so legal yeah you know and like but still creative okay so i think that like when we came to Santa Ana and Anaheim and, all, and this area of the world, like what I saw most was like Chicano styles of graffiti and like gang styles, like okay, like F Troop and Eastside Buena Park and Fullerton Tokers Town. All those dudes like had plaques all over the all over the city. So I'd see that style of stuff and had the same sort of thoughts, like, "Whoa, that's crazy!" Like, who are these guys? Who are these guys? <laughs> and well, and when are they doing this stuff? But I was also at school exposed to like who some of these dudes were, you know, like they're okay. actual gangbangers, and like you start learning the ideas of the culture and like yeah, and and the experience of of what that is and like why they do it, and so you you, you I started learning more and more about it, and it, it all of those all of those elements appealed to me. Yeah, and then when I saw stuff that was happening on the freeways back in the day, okay. like when people were really exploding and like doing like full color murals on yeah. on the freeway walls that pushed me further to be like oh man this is like this is something that i want to do that coupled with like the movie style wars and okay. you know uh wild style and like the book spray can art yeah like shout out you know uh Chalafant and um uh, and cooper yeah the two creators of that book and that actual uh style wars documentary those things like started inspiring me like oh man i could do this too Okay. And sort of like studying those styles and like learning how to like, I don't know if you've, if you've read those books, but yeah, some I've, of the photos, some of the photos like sort of show the progress of how a piece is done, like drawn. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because you see that, you see that the fill's done first and the outline second and 3D is third. You know what I mean? You, yeah, yeah. At first you're just like <laughs> in awe, like how the hell are they doing this? You yeah. Know, like. Like you can't figure it out on your own, but with with tools like that, you start like realizing, oh shit, this is how you actually do it. To kind of to kind of actually have a guide to to lead you in the right direction. Yeah, for sure. And to take a small step back, brother. Yeah, yeah, do it. Um, coming from Philadelphia, and you know, coming to Santa Ana, Anaheim, and then going to school where you said you would meet some of these guys that were part of these gangs. Yeah, yeah. Was it ever an issue, kind of like being an outsider and them looking at you like? Who the hell is this guy? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, I'm with Ito, you know, yeah. I'm the white boy in the group. So it's like I stood out like a sore thumb a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, especially if you show up at a house party and you're yeah. like, you know, and then we were B-boys and like poppers. Okay. And we already had style and we were like dancing and shit. And yeah. like, that doesn't go over too well if you're showing up in somebody's hood and they're just like, 
having a kickback and <laughs> you know they got a dj but <laughs> you're taking all the attention away from them especially with the girls so it was kind of sometimes it wasn't so good ending <laughs> But being a b-boy, you, you guys had a different style of dressing than the the Chicano gangster. Yeah, one hundred percent. Can you talk a little bit about the difference in that? Yeah, I mean, ours was heavily influenced from the East Coast, like striped lees and like fat laces and pumas, and yeah. you know, like the Kango look and like Kazals and Adidas, everything. And and when these guys look at you, like, hey man, what are you guys wearing? What is this? No, I mean they were exposed to some of it through movies and stuff, yeah. and like you know the popping and and, and breaking thing. I feel like popping was such like a West Coast influence dance yeah. that, you know, some of the dudes that were just like, you would think like just hardcore vatos were like, could get down like really well. With the pop like Yeah, we're serious dancers. Oh, wow. So, you know, it, the two sort of intermingled, you know, sometimes it was like, yeah. sometimes it was cool, but sometimes, you know, like I said, in, in certain situations, it wasn't cool, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you looked at, you got looked at as like the outsider, so, you know. And at what age is a young Meek tells himself, like, you know what? I want to get into this graffiti stuff. I want to come up with a name and I'm going to pursue it. I think, like, the first few names I was playing around with was yeah. probably at, like, 15. Okay. You know, I wrote, like, I wrote Scheme. Okay. There was a homie that from from Inglewood because yeah. they had they had busing in our high school. So they would bus people in from Inglewood because, you know, they they thought that it was a good idea to, like, bring people from the inner city out of those situations and like get them out of the school system in those areas because gangbanging was so prevalent that it was just becoming like a, like an almost unstoppable force. Yeah. So their ideas was like, let's bring these kids into Orange County. Okay. But in a lot of ways that sort of backfired because they brought the culture with them and the culture ended up integrating in the already existing culture. So like gangbanging became the thing. It became like a trend. And Santana. Santa Ana, Anaheim, yeah. Buena Park, all of those things, like, they sort of, like, I don't want to say. It was, like, a perfect combination? Yeah, it was a bad storm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with, like, the movie Colors. Yeah. It's sort of, like, Hollywood was sort of, like, I don't, glorifying that kind of lifestyle and, like, you know, I don't know, like. Making it, like, it's cool to be that. Ghetto, like porn almost like yeah. you know being an outside observer like ooh this is exciting like yeah. you know people are dying and shit and but you know and the, the reality of it all like it it brought like horrible elements together and like people that were already poor or suffering yeah. gravitated to it I mean I I had a little bit of time where I you know I thought it was hard for a minute and like yeah. hung out with some dudes and you know when you for me when the reality of a gun in my face set in I knew that that lifestyle was not for me so. Definitely. That's when I was like, all right, you know, but it's trying. Gotta stop right? fronting on him. <laughs> stop fronting like I'm this person because I'm not that person. You, know? you got to be ready for what, what comes with. Yeah, 100. percent So at 15, what year will you say this is? Ooh, 85. So in 85, you you're you're doodling around. You said, yeah, catching uh, little tags, writing scheme. Yeah, scribes and like, you know, finding out what mean streaks were because <laughs> mean streak was like a big deal. Like, yeah, it wasn't something that you could just order. It was like something you had to rack from like a, like a a paper supply place yeah. or something strange like that. So, so in Santa Ana, border Anaheim, or um, what was actually out there available to, like, rack or, or get utensils? Like, where were you going to get your stuff? Oh, like, 99-cent store. Um, any sort of, like, uh, like uh, Home Depot or, or, like, True Value. Okay. Um, we were always on the lookout for, like, even in the grocery stores, you could rack fat caps off the, uh, off the glass cleaner. Okay. And oven cleaners. Back then it was oven cleaners. Okay. So we'd get the fat caps off the under oven cleaners and then like steel testers from art supply places that had the little t actual tester cans and the tip is a thin tip. Okay. So we, <laughs> everywhere we went, man, like, you know. Yeah, you had to be creative and, and put something together and make it happen. Exactly. And that was exciting too. That's, that's what added to the appeal of graffiti. It's like this adventure, like you need to gather up your shit, you need to find it. Yeah. No one's really going to tell you, you know, where it is or how to get it, but you got to figure it out for yourself and then go out and apply it. And was there already people out there getting up that you were watching as far as graffiti, like hip hop style graffiti? Oh, yeah. I mean, there was already dudes like putting in work. If I was thinking back to those times, it'd be like Risk. Okay. Uh, all the WCA guys. Yeah. Oh, they were, they were out there in Santa Ana? No, no, no. Because this is like seeing stuff in L.A., Okay. And being inspired by the stuff in LA. 
in Orange County, it's tough to say, like, I mean, in all honesty, I didn't really start re meeting real writers until further down the line, like Dove and Fear from DCV Crew. Oh, okay. Like, those dudes, those were the guys who were actually putting in a lot of work. So would it, would it be fair that back in 85, the graffiti scene back in Anaheim, Santa Ana wasn't really that alive? Uh, it was fledgling. It's okay. like very, it was starting to, to be something. Because, okay. you know, everyone was being influenced by like, by like the Hollywood ideals of what hip hop was like yeah. breaking beat street, all of that stuff was in the popular culture. So people were really gravitating to that. A lot of kids were breaking. Okay. A lot of kids, you know, you'd walk in the malls, yeah. somebody to have a piece of cardboard <laughs> and instantly it'd doom, be a doom, battle, doom. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. everywhere you went, like that was the fun of it. So, oh, okay. So yeah, like as far as like specific dudes that I saw doing stuff in Orange County, it'd be hard to pinpoint like, okay. who that was. Gotcha. It, it would be easier to say that I was influenced more heavily by the LA writers and seeing what going into LA and seeing their stuff. Being in Orange County, how do you make yourself aware of what's going on in LA? You how did I go hop about the that? bus? So you just hop on the bus and start riding the bus? Rough, tough, and dangerous, the RTD, <laughs> right into right into the city and like go on a mission. Yeah. You know, just like get up as much as you possibly could that way and back. So you weren't really looking forward to go to LA. You were just more on like, I'm going to get up as much as I can. That too. Both. You know, okay. seeing new shit, like being inspired by, by stuff that you see. And like I said, man, there was some wild, like actual production stuff going on, like on the freeways, yeah. on the retainer walls. People were doing like full on like characters, backgrounds, themes. What freeway like would you say shit. this is? Uh, the Hollywood freeway. Was that the 101? Okay. The 101. 101. Uh, some stuff on the 405, not as much, but mostly the, like the one-on-one -on -one into Hollywood. Okay. And how long till you bump into your first uh, L.A. graffiti writer? Uh, I got into a car accident. Okay. And the dude that hit me when we, when we, <laughs> when we started exchanging information, yeah. turns out that the kid, you know, because like we, we dressed the dress, you know what I mean? Yeah. So immediately we were like, oh, okay, what's up? You write, blah, blah, blah. He's like, oh, yeah. I'm so-and-so from OTR. And we're like, OTR, what's that? Oh, he's like, oh, On the Run. And we had known On the Run from an old breaking song called On the Run. Okay. It's a break beat. Yeah. So we're like, oh, that's a dope name, blah, blah, blah. And, like, turns out, you know, OTR is, like, one of the most, you know, one of the oldest established crews in, in LA. LA. And so, yeah, like, that was kind of, like, one of the most memorable first-time run-ins. And then you run into these guys and... I mean, not guys, but you ran into him and maybe possibly other guys. Yeah. So do you start maneuvering yourself more towards L.A. or do you stay in Orange County and keep painting Orange County? Do both. Yeah. Because, I mean, home base is, in, is Orange County. Okay. But, like, there's a lot more yards in L.A., so you start learning about the yards. You meet other writers. Okay. We met other writers on the buses. We, Definitely. We, you know, we meet other writers at, like, events, like b-boy yeah. events or hip-hop-oriented events. What was available as far as to, to paint like yards and et cetera in Orange County oh, at that time? Orange County. There was stuff borderline like Norwalk had a yeah. big, like a big spot that we'd paint all the time. Um, mostly just like little weird ditch spots. Okay. Especially in the early days. Like there wasn't really like a lot of established yards. Okay. There were freight yards. Okay. But that didn't come until later for me especially. Okay. So... I know you say you were writing Schema at, at first. Yeah. So at what point do you come up with the name Meeks and what was behind the name? How did that come about? Well, the, the whole scheme thing was kind of in that like wannabe gangbanging period. Okay. So to me, it was like a life change, like needed a name change for me too. Yeah. So I took Meeks and reversed it. I mean, sorry, took Scheme and reversed it into Meeks. Yeah. And then dropped the KS because it's, you know, it's quicker to write yeah. four letters. So it just naturally became like that name. Mm -hmm. And I always kind of like the concept, like, you know, the meek shall inherit the earth. <laughs> so yeah. for me, that was like a little meaning to it. But yeah, other than that, it's just sort of like a flip and a change. And, and you stay dedicated to the name because you've been meeks ever since. Yeah, ever since. What year were you saying meeks was developed? Probably the, the name? 80s, 88, 87, 88. Okay. Yeah. And to your knowledge, brother, I'm getting into an LA. What do you think? To your knowledge, was like the very first spot that you got to paint in LA, like a yard spot, yeah, or anything in general, yard or Belmont, or Belmont, yeah, Belmont would have been the first. And Belmont, Belmont was a a, a dope and wild place, yeah, at that time, yeah, because like 
Belmont was right in the middle of the headhunters hood and the headhunters were like serious about protecting their areas sometimes. And, you know, we got rolled a couple of times and got all our paint took and, but they would just come up and be like, Hey, give me all your paint or how would that? Yeah. Go I mean like, even like the youngest, the youngest, they usually send the youngest. Yeah. Strapped. And you know, at first you're just like, Oh, who's this little kid? Yeah. And then he's like, Hey, what's up? This is headhunters, blah, blah, blah. Pulls out a gun and it's like, it's on. You gotta be like, all right, cool. Take whatever you need. We're, we're, you know what I mean? We're just, we're just here to paint. We're not yeah. here to look like infringe on your territory or your hood or whatever. So having the opportunity to paint and, and Belmont Tunnel, did you ever think it was going to disappear and be gone like today? Where mm -hmm. like you go back there and there's no trace of it ever being painted? No, of course. I mean, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, but you know things change, man. Yeah, definitely. It's it is a shame that it's gone, but by the same token, it's like you can't stop progress sometimes. And being at Belmont Tunnel, that you get the chance to communicate with a lot of local writers from the area? Yeah, 100%. And that's, like, how a lot of, like, relationships were made. Like, you well, meet other people doing pieces there. Well, what are you, what are some of your, your early relationships that you could speak about that you met up there at uh, Belmont Tunnel? Belmont specifically. I don't know if I met them at Belmont, but the K4Ps. Okay. Zuko. Shout out Zuko. We had him in. Yeah, there. shout out Zuko. What's up, man? Um. Who else have we run into? Some of the UTIs. Okay. Um, I don't know who else specifically uh, off the top of my head. It's hard to say. It was it I was a friend like, hey, what's up? I'm so and so. It was it kind of like, hey, what are you doing over here? Sometimes, I mean, sometimes there was that 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 element of like, you know, there's there's sort of a gang banging element involved in yeah. graph. And I, I mean, it's not to say that it's only West Coast because yeah. from the beginning, even the East Coast, like as early as like the '70s, people showed up to like graffiti shows with guns and like shot people and shit. So okay. it's not like it's not a diss to West Coast. Yeah, but it's definitely ingrained in the culture. Definitely, just because of how people grow up. You know, they have family members that might be in those situations, or they are expected to be in those situations. And it sort of carried on into the culture in a lot of ways. Do you think that tag being an era had a lot to do with that situation? I think to, to call it an era, I don't know if it's necessarily like the true the true definition of what happened. Yeah. Because like I said, man, it's always been there. Okay. And I feel like uh, it just it just became a focus of a lot more people in okay. that time period. The the get the tag banging era. So, yeah, a lot of people, especially younger dudes, expected it to be that way, so they carried it on that way, you know? And they, st they started pursuing that um, that character. Yeah, it, it changed the culture in a lot of ways, especially in that era. Okay. So, you know, you're, you're, you're you know, moving around painting. Uh, at any point, do you bring any of these writers back to Orange County to paint with you, or is it just like you're just up and about? No, no, there was exchanges. Like, people would come, hey, you know, we want to check out the spot you guys have, and you know, vice versa, like, hey, we heard about this yard. You guys yeah. should come through. We're going to be there today, blah, blah, blah. And out through the bus. Yeah, the bus. <laughs> but then, you know, eventually as we got older, we had cars. And yeah. Like, we would hook up and, like, do little missions and shit. And especially, like, in the freight days, you know, we would link up a lot. And, like, someone, I, someone would know a spot. I know a lot of guys um, don't understand the, the, the movement of the bus, you know, like catching the bus for a, a certain amount of hours to get from point A to point B. Right. And, and bumping into people, meeting people, and, you know, riding up the bus. Right. Can you talk a little bit about those experiences for you? I mean, that was exciting for us. It's like, you know, like uh, the mystery, like I said before, is like, and meeting people that you've seen up. Yeah. It's like this weird sort of like fame, like, uh -huh. oh, shit, you write blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh, damn, like, I see your stuff on this line and this line and this line. It's crazy. Yeah. Like, how do you get up so much? And, you know, you just start talking about technique and tools and like, oh, yeah, well, I use this or I use that. And, you know, you just learn from each other a little I bit. I think the, the acknowledgement of someone knowing who you are over you putting in work sometimes could be like, oh, wow, this guy knows me. Yeah, it's a trip. It makes <laughs> you feel like, oh, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing, actual people, other notice, I mean, other people actually notice what I'm doing and, and take note of it. Yeah. And even I know if, even though it's this weird, like sort of secret society in a way where only, you know, <laughs> only we appreciate it. But, yeah. you know, we're the ones who appreciate it. So. And we're at this, at this point, I'm, I'm sure you were still making like your own markers and inks and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. Can you talk a little bit about um, how, how you were building this stuff? Like what, how, what were you putting together? We did so many weird experiments, man. We took like cologne bottles and like took all the cologne out and then like 
you know, like since it has a male, you put it in the female, yeah. like fill it up with paint. Yeah. Just have it on you in case you get rolled. Like, oh, it's just cologne. And that's happened to us a few times. Like, Already? oh, it's just cologne. And the cop take it out, put it back in. It's just cologne. We don't care about that. <laughs> but in actuality, we were like catching tags all night with these little cologne bottles. Or How many tags would you get off that little cologne well, bottle? Like maybe two, three. <laughs> <laughs> just and something then, to have on and deck. Back to fill up. Yeah, back to fill up. Like, <laughs> go out again. Or even like my dude would like put mean streak inside a uh, a chapstick oh wow <laughs> just to keep it concealed you know what i mean yeah, just like hey like, man it's, it's just it's, it's just, just chapstick. chapstick yeah so if we ever got you know rolled or like searched it would just look like something it's not and how were those experiences when you were get rolled on by like the cops how were they treating you guys at that time oh like you know public enemy number one like hey you damn tagger like that or yeah yeah you fucking kid you know like ruining our city but you know like people like you and it's stuff people like you that make this place shitty and and now that we get into that subject brother does it ever make you feel a certain type of way that um you guys were there going through this to build what graffiti is today you know like today's more accepted yeah back then it was more like hey pointing the finger like hey what are you doing does it ever make you feel some type of way where like it's kind of like damn i had to go through all this to make it happen and mm, the generation now not that they have to love you guys or, right. or, or praise you guys but right. just a little of acknowledgement which some don't does that ever kind of like bother you it doesn't bother me so much because i mean to me like i equate it to hip-hop because i've always been involved in hip-hop yeah and like the hip-hop of today ain't for me okay it's for kids you know what i mean yeah. it's like the stuff the kids are into doesn't necessarily mean that like it's whack yeah it's just what they like at the yeah. time like you know, just because other people didn't accept us yeah. for what we were doing doesn't mean that I should hold a grudge against kids coming up now. Definitely. But, you know, in the in terms of acceptance, I you know, I don't know if like, putting in illegal work is still putting in illegal work. I don't think people are going to ever accept that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, if you get rolled, like, catching a tag or scribing or something, I'm sure you're not treated with respect. I think now it's a, a bit more lenient depending on what you're writing. Because obviously mm. if you go to a, a business front, Right. And you scrap all the windows. Right. It, it's more like of a problem whether they catch you like, I don't know, maybe a public bus that's already sure. destroyed. You know what I mean? Sure. So, yeah, it's because I've been in conversations where like a lot of uh, younger generations would be like, well, who are all these old guys? Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And it's like, that's why I asked the question, like, right. does it ever bother you? No. I mean, like having a platform like this is dope because like younger kids can get exposed to like, the history of of especially los angeles and, yeah you know the surrounding areas and like the influence that like people still have i mean like for me i still see you know air style in other kids stuff yeah and even in my own stuff i've seen it you know come through and it's like to me that's inspiring because graffiti for me has always been a thing where like i see it and no yeah. matter where i see it all over the world i know that a human being did it and that they're alive and experiencing life and putting something there for you to know that Definitely. they're there. So it's like to see that is inspiring to me. And it, if it's whack or not, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's, it's being done. And like that's sort of like the foundation that like my mentors like Dove and Fear okay. taught me. Like it doesn't matter. You're up. Yeah. Like, cause you're like bummed on your shit. Like, oh man, it's so whack and blah, blah. When you first start, you're like, yeah. oh, I hate the way that came out. I want to get better. I and wanna... they were always like, just focus on the fact that you're up because yeah. that's what matters. It's like, you're going through the process and nothing gets better without practice. Not definitely. I totally agree because at the end of the point, you got, you, you got to get better and to get better, you got to keep painting. Yep. You got to, you got to keep putting in the work, keep putting in the work and keep going at it until you finally get that one style. Like, damn. Now it's time to build. Yeah, this is mine. <laughs> yeah, for sure. This belongs to me. Right. So how long do you go till you start getting mentored by W Fear? You say you, they were mentors to you. Yeah. How long do you, you meet them and er then you guys, you know, start hanging out and start mentoring you? Early 90s. Okay. Like 90, probably like one or two. Yeah. And uh, by that point, I'm already like 20, you know, 20, 21. Okay. Old for the game. Yeah. But i'm me you know so yeah. i was always gonna be me and then you know like those dudes you know taught me a lot about like 
how, how to behave in freights and yeah. like like at the yard like you you don't leave a mess you like clean up after yourself and like you don't cover the numbers and just ways that like not very many people knew if you just go in blind and just start pissing yeah. all over shit leaving cans everywhere yeah writing like numbers. writing over the numbers and if you write over the numbers if you know it or not they'll buff your shit it'll be gone yeah so if you respect the trains even a little bit like you'll get some type of respect back yeah and it, it'll roll and like you'll get fame i mean that's the bottom line right you're trying to get people to see it definitely can you touch a little bit about how did that come about you meeting dove and fear Ooh, oh man i don't specifics probably the huntington beach breaker walls which okay. was like a giant public art slash uh um permission wall spot okay so it was all the way down the beach in huntington beach and uh a group of like art curators and stuff had opened the walls yeah. in the seventies and artists would go there and paint murals. And then in the eighties, graffiti artists started showing up and saying, Hey, we want to paint too. Okay. And they allowed it. Okay. So then all of these beautiful pieces started happening and like writers from all over everywhere, California would come hang out and, on the beach and peace all day. Okay. And that's where like, I believe that's like the first time I met Dove and Fear was at the okay. Huntington Beach Wall. It's kind of more like, hey, what's up? You're right too. What's yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh, shit. You, you know, you're from you know, this area of town. Me too. Blah, blah, blah. And we all had a lot of things in common. So oh, I think that's a that's a dope thing that, you know, you guys were able to communicate and, you know, keep the assistant friendship. Yeah, for sure. And at what point do you enter Cruise? So you're Meeks. You say you start Meeks. Yeah. And then after that, how long after that do you start entering crews? And what was your first crew? Our first crew was me and a couple of other buddies. As soon as we started writing was ASM, okay. which is like Against Society's Methods. You know, a bunch of different acronyms. Okay. But, um, it was me, this dude Gleek, and another cat. Um, damn, I can't remember what he wrote. It was so long ago. But, you know, like little kid <laughs> shit. Yeah. So, yeah, that was the very first crew. And then... The series, the only serious crew after that for me was BTP is when I met Posh. Okay. Which is kind of like 93, 94 I met Posh. And how did that friendship come up? How did you guys meet? I met Posh uh, at a place called Coos Cafe in Santa Ana. Okay. And Coos Cafe was uh, a place that basically had like poetry open mics and like coffee and like art going on. And so okay. we kind of gravitated to it because we're creatives and we wanted to hang out and yeah. with other creative people. And so I started hanging out the open mics because I was already like writing lyrics and shit and rapping a little bit, okay. you know, because I'm a b-boy. It's like all aspects of it. I was I would my try check, to. my check. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I'd show up to like these <clears throat> poetry readings and like, yeah. you know, started like hearing what they were doing and it really appealed to me. So I'd like just freeform write poetry and yeah. get up and breathe and stuff. And I met Posh through that because he was doing the same thing. Okay. And, you know, just so happened, I was like, oh shit, you're Posh from cbs and he's like oh yeah i write i used you know i know all these dudes and i have this crew btp that i started and up north and you know one thing led to the next and i got down with him and then okay. it, the crew started growing from there we started getting more and more members okay so he was he already had btp mm -hmm. so there was already members before you came into the picture yeah and i think like it was kind of a, a dot a dot uh dormant crew okay. like it had stopped yeah and then he moved from he moved from uh Santa Barbara to the Santa Ana Anaheim area. Okay. And had him been writing for a little bit. And then when me and him, me and him connected, he was just starting to get back into it again. Okay. Dope. So it's kind of perfect timing. And does he bring you along to meet the CBS guys or was um, it kind of just strictly BTP? I think it was more natural. Like we'd be just go to graffiti events and like yeah. there'd be other CBS dudes there and I'd get introduced to them like anger and axis and all those okay. dudes. And how did how did the graffiti come up uh, about at Coos Cafe for those that might not know what, what Coos Cafe was? Well, we were hanging out there so much that the owner Dennis Louis yeah. shout out Dennis Louis shout out Dennis uh, Louis Coos Cafe Santa Ana. <laughs> um, he basically asked me, "Hey, you know, like I see, you know, that you're into like the hip hop world and like the graffiti aspect of things. Like, do you want to come work with me here at Coos and be in charge of that?" Cause we don't have that culture here and we want to bring it here okay because he's like this is a place open for everyone it was an all-ages venue they just started having bands play there okay mostly acoustic and then it started becoming real bands with like full equipment okay and uh he's like yeah i want you to join me basically and like you handle all the hip-hop oriented shit yeah like we have these walls in the back you can open it up to like people to come in peace yeah 
And like, then from that, like I started uh, an outreach through breakdance and I would have b-boy sessions every Sunday at Coos. Okay. And then eventually that grew into like having a crew of kids that were all neighborhood kids. Yeah. And it became a true outreach where we were like taking these kids and having them perform. Okay. And like trying to get a little money in their pockets. And basically like one thing led to the next and I just became a fixture basically at Coos and I became the dude in charge of that a- a- aspect of the place. As far as um, you you say you had a b-boy going on and you were helping out the children with b-boy. Mm-hmm. But I know you guys all had punk shows, hip hop oh, yeah. shows, and rap shows. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about that? All the punk shows and like the the independent music shows. Yeah. All of those were booked by other people there at Coos that were involved as well. All volunteers mostly. Okay. Um, all the hip hop shit was my responsibility. So I like through being involved in in you know going to shows and yeah. being the graph culture and hip hop culture. I brought who I respected to the place. DJs like small MCs, people that were coming up. Yeah. Like at first we do open mics and those open mics would turn into shows because people want to showcase their actual recorded music. Okay. So we'd have, you know, not so known people with some touring people too. Yeah. Like bigger names. So, you know, for the draw. And then one thing led to the next and it became like a monthly event that I would have a hip hop oriented event. And did you ever have a big name come out of there? Like someone that became an established artist, whether it was punk rock or hip hop or b-boy? Yeah. I mean, the first person that comes to mind is Aloe Black. Aloe Black was like, I feel like Koo's venue was one of the very first venues that he performed at and like got his chops together and like really like formulated who he was as an artist. And as you know, now you hear the name Aloe Black, he's like an international music star. What is the feeling, brother, if you do come across this when you see a child that you help out, that you helped out with this program? Right. And to see them now be grown men and kind of be like, hey, man, thank you. I appreciate you. What is that feeling like? I mean, it's the most rewarding feeling you could have as a human being. I yeah. Think. Like you, you, I don't know. It's like, uh, I don't know. It's inexplicable. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's of course, it's a great feeling. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you kind of feel like a proud father in a way. Yeah. But yeah. But it's dope. Because I know it must be an amazing feeling to be able to help a child that wants to do something but knows, doesn't have no resources. 100%. And to be that resource and open up that door and let them be creative, it's something special. For sure. And I, and I really loved being like, I don't know, the, the, the catalyst for that. Yeah. Like having the spot, you know. And what year would you say it was when uh, Coos Cafe was uh, already bringing in the hip hop and stuff like that? When they brought you on? What year would you say that is? Uh, 94, 95. Okay. Started progressing, 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000. And as far as the graffiti writers, you would just meet them at shows and be like, hey, I, I got the spot over here. You guys want to come paint? Well, the, like a natural thing, progression started happening where people started hearing that we had a yard. Oh, wow. Because other writers would talk to other writers. And yeah. They'd be like, oh, shit, there's a yard in Santa Ana. Like, yeah. it's open. Come through and paint. Yeah. And it was cool because, you know, the, the art was constantly changing. Like, all the kids that weren't involved in that culture were seeing it, getting inspired by it. Some of it even turned into graffiti artists. And okay, it's kind of a cool, a cool thing to have, like just this natural thing happen at this venue. And for the most part, everything was smooth. Or did you guys ever have a clash? There were like maybe a writer or uh, a writer and a punk guy they didn't get it long. Was there ever a problem that was severely severe not not within the culture outside of it of course the city didn't like us and there were lots of articles written about us saying that we were like drug manufacturers oh wow we were like creating crime by having graffiti in our you know on our premises and allowing kids that were underage to paint and so we had a lot of clashes with the city i did a lot of like uh you know outreach through like i do press releases i talk to the press i try to get you know Try to get the creatives on our side, basically, yeah. to show our side of it, too. But, you know, Santa Ana, especially Orange County, yeah. very conservative mind state, even though Santa Ana at the time was in fucking turmoil. I mean, okay. in all honesty, like, the Santa Ana PD was one of the police departments that got busted for manufacturing and selling cocaine. Oh, wow. Because they thought it would be a good idea to make crack on the premises, sell it to people, and then bust the people that they were selling crack to. When in essence, you know, there was corruption going on where they were actually making money and like reselling this crack over and oh, over. Oh, wow, man. That's... Yeah, so that, you know, like, <laughs> you know, they're pointing their finger at us yeah. while at the same time doing like some really, really dirty shit to people. And what caused Coos Cafe to close down, to close its doors? 
it's just a matter of like constantly fighting with the city, constantly fighting with like trying to get permits, constantly fighting to like, you know, have our voice in the city. Yeah. And I think that the pressures of that environment, like it just, uh, it just whittled away at us a lot okay. mentally. And it was just got to a point where it was like, okay, the natural progression is for us to, to stop. And yeah. Dennis Louie, to his credit, didn't stop. He brought, he got another space actually in Long Beach, in downtown Long Beach. Okay. And opened another Coos and had a venue for a very long time there before he closed that venue as well. Was it called Coos Cafe? It was called Coos. I don't know if it was called Coos Cafe or just Coos. Okay. But it was, yeah, predominantly art and music based. Oh, that's dope. Yeah. Shout out him for continuing yeah. the, his legacy of yeah, keeping Dennis, building. Dennis Louie's got a really big heart and, and, He's still an activist to this day. So shout out him for all everything he did. For sure. Um, I know you had a member drugs from BTP that is no longer with us. Yeah, rest rest in peace. May he rest in peace. Can you talk a little bit about meeting him and his involvement with BTP? Yeah. Um, drugs was kind of part of the younger generation of dudes that got into the crew. Okay. Him and Dell, aka Shucks. Yeah. Um Olay, Jolt. Those dudes were like they were hungry and like out bombing and like yeah. really trying to get their name out and like putting in a lot of work. Okay. And for me, I was getting older, getting more involved with like coups, especially yeah. and like having to keep a low profile. <laughs> so, you know, you don't want to be up everywhere no. and then go to Coos Cafe. You know, like it's this guy. Yeah. Like yeah. face attached to everything already. Yeah. And like, so, you know, like those dudes were like putting in crazy work, especially drugs and, and Dell. And yeah. Olay. How did they come into your guys' radar? The, was them visiting Coos or was it another situation? I think it was more through uh, Posh. Okay. Like knowing those dudes and also just like putting out the energy that he wanted to build the crew. Yeah. So I think like the natural progression was for like new hungry kids to come in and be like, oh, we want to be a part of this too. Because I know Dale, also known as Shucks, mm -hmm. said that he felt in a way that BTP became like the stepping ground to get into CBS after a while. Yeah, it became a feeding crew, a feeder how, crew. How did how did how did that come about? Was it just mutual friendships, or I think because Posh's involvement in CBS yeah. is like long established in that crew, and that like he would start, you know, they paint with dudes from CBS, and yeah. BTP dudes would paint with CBS, and yeah, a sort of a natural progression. And I think like you know. I'm hoping it's not the case, but I think some people had the motivation to be like, well, if I get in BTP, then eventually I'll be in CBS. Because okay. CBS was such like a more known, more famous crew. And like, yeah. of course, they had Mir and like, you know, people that were like world renowned graffiti writers, Axis. Yeah. Did you have the opportunity to meet Skate from CBS? I did not. Okay. I did. He was gone before I was like introduced to anybody from okay. CBS. Um, that was around the time that we were like hanging out th at Hex TGO. Shout out Hex TGO. Shout out Hex TGO. Um, the original hip hop shop uh, off of Melrose. We hung out there a lot and like a lot of b-boy sessions and stuff going on over there. For those people that don't understand the importance of Hex TGO's hip hop shop, yeah, can you talk about a little bit about the environment and being there for witnessing the shop? I mean, there's like no comparable energy to that shop because like Hex is such just an open hearted dude. Yeah, and like really you know really invested in graffiti and hip-hop in general yes and like that shop brought so many people together as you know as coos did yeah like from all over different parts of the city because of all the similar interests yeah and like there was such little like venue for that that his shop became like a an epicenter okay that basically like inspired thousands of people man like he was the first dude to do it like he was the one of the first dudes or the first dude yeah. To have graffiti on clothing and actually manufacture t-shirts that had graph on it and like be one of the founders of streetwear. You know what I'm saying? Like what was, was the name of the brand? Sorry to cut you off. No, it's all good. It was called Fat Cap. And Fat he, Cap. he still has it to this day. Like he's actually done some re-releases of the OG like uh designs that he had back in the day. So you would walk into the shop and he would have his gear and what else did he have up there? Oh, so much stuff. It was like like the belt buckles. He would be airbrushing because he's an amazing airbrushing. Oh, he was artist. airbrushing. Yeah, like so he's airbrushing people's stuff. Yeah. Like hooking people up with like like these uh like his version of fat laces, which were like double size, like New York, like huge shit. You know? <laughs> really dope shit. Like shit that you couldn't get anywhere else. Yeah. And like um, you know, like he sold like throwback adidas and and yeah. stuff that like you couldn't find anywhere else because it was all going out of fashion 
but for b-boys it was always in fashion so he was like the the hub to come get all this stuff 100 percent, like okay. medallions and like you know like tips and like tip holders and like everything like yeah. stuff that you know you wouldn't find anywhere else was he was he selling supply at the at that time like did he have paint and stuff mm, like the whole idea of like having painted shops didn't come till much 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 later i was accepting that because I, I know a lot of guys are still like on that no nah, man you got a rack but the idea of it becoming behind a shelf and buying it from an because most of, of the guys that own graffiti shops now, most of them are graffiti writers yeah. or they have a past. So it kind of wouldn't be fair to rack from your own community. No. But how did that idea come about, especially with Montana coming around that $5 can right? per can, right. the idea of paying for it? How did that, how, how was it comprehending that and just being like, all right, it is what it is? I think it was a l slow progression to that. Yeah. Because, you know, when they first came out, they were rare, uh -huh. hard to find. Yeah um you know only certain people had that shit that and the beltons okay the belton is another company that like i used to love huge. belton when they barely got over here yeah belton's dope i like like three marbles i remember it was great spraying. coverage stays bright forever yeah that's yeah, dope paint but i i personally i always had respect for it because i knew that graph writers developed it okay and for graffiti writers that's a huge step that's a yeah. huge step to like Especially, it's a middle finger to Krylon. I mean, I love old school Krylon, but by the same token, they hated writers. Definitely. They didn't want anything to do with them. A lot of writers approached them in the early days and said, yeah. hey, I want to work with you. And they're like, fuck that. No. We don't want nothing to do with you guys. Nothing. You guys are fucking vandals. We don't want to support that kind of behavior, but you know, the rest is history. That could and have been so big, though. Look at what happened. Their shit's whack and watery and nobody uses this shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what i mean like the new stuff nobody uses unless you're desperate and like you know uh yeah they, it could have been a relationship that they fostered but they didn't yeah and like i said to me it's inspiring to see graffiti writers progress yeah definitely and like take it to new levels and they took it to new levels and developed their own tools which is amazing to me do you think there's a reason why to this day we still don't have a, a spray can company from la like built in la for la I, there's been attempts um oh really yeah oh, man i can't remember the name <laughs> there's been a couple of companies that have started and stopped oh really yeah uh i can't remember the names off the top how many would you say i think two two so they were they Is were cobra la or no i don't think cobra's la uh yeah i can't remember the name man because i know a uh, shout out slick i know slick is doing bukkake now dope yeah shout but um uh, I, prior to him i don't think i i can remember anyone like saying i'm gonna make a spray paint company here in la and distribute it out of la well you know what they say right like the best business ideas are born out of a necessity so yeah if you see the necessity fill it <laughs> <laughs> step up start making paint spray paint company coming, <laughs> coming soon can we got no, you heard it first got no control spray cans coming your way but um it wasn't like the adjustment though like the adjustment to this to these new companies coming in like belton you had montana right and i think after montana possibly iron lac yeah iron lac from australia and i know they were sponsoring writers to kind of get themselves out there 100 you know? was that how was it like being part of the culture at that time was it kind of like okay cool i well, see you guys I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a shot because from sorry. going from racking you know you're racking all these cans to like Here's a hundred bucks and you only get a couple of them. Right. I mean, that's a tough line to walk. Yeah. I mean, in all honesty, like for me, I wasn't racking. Yeah. Because I was older already and yeah. like trying not to go to jail. Yeah. For racking. <laughs> so, I mean, sure, I'd go buy my paint. It wasn't no thing to me, but I, I get it. Like there's yeah. purists. Like Definitely. there's purists with anything. There's purists that say, you know, like if you're on a legal wall, it's not graffiti. Or if you're on a canvas, it's not graffiti. Yeah. Or, you know, they have rules about blah, blah, blah. To me, art art doesn't have rules. I mean, why would it have rules? Dude? Definitely. I agree 100%. And, you know, now that we get in a little bit into that, so you come from a time where, like, social media wasn't really such a big impact. Right. So how was it adjusting, like, when you started having the guys getting the interviewers, the interviews started coming in, mm -hmm. the news? Because at, at the beginning, it was kind of like everybody's low-key. No one knows who nobody is. Right. But then you have like the news involved, then you have interviewers, then you got people writing books. 
Right. And then you got platforms like Art Crimes and 50 Millimeters on the internet. Right. Was it hard adjusting to all that stuff coming from a time where like it wasn't there? I embraced it. I saw it as an opportunity to yeah. reach a broader audience. Okay. For me, I'm like if my piece is up on a site that can be seen all over the world, then more power to yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it, it didn't frighten me or it didn't like, didn't make me feel some kind of way about it at all. Like, uh, cause back know. then you had to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go get it developed. Yeah. Get doubles made. So you give it to the crew yeah. or mail them out or mail them out. I mean, yeah. that, that was a great thing too. We would like do photo exchanges and like, I think that not a lot of people think about it, but the hip hop community, especially the graffiti community yeah. learned a lot from independent punk rock whether they know it or not okay. because it's DIY everything's DIY then yeah. it was all DIY as well it's like especially with that with photos and and you would have like pen pals of other writers yeah. in other cities exchanging flicks like all that shit went on it was exciting to be a part of that too and like I think like just so everybody knows that's that's a heavy influence <laughs> yeah. on what we did too at the time period definitely and were you part of any magazines like Can't Control or Big Time or anything like that? No, I never had any stuff run in there. I'd never really sent flicks or anything like okay. that to magazines. It wasn't really that important for me at the time. I, I was a fan and I yeah. and I and I supported them for sure. I bought their stuff all the time. And we would all like sit around and look at it and like just have sessions and draw and like look at shit. Did you ever have a starstruck moment where you kind of met a writer that you wanted to meet for a long time and you're like, oh damn. I mean, it. I was a little flustered when I first met Hex because X was just doing some like amazing work, like huge work, like yeah. nothing I'd ever seen in my life. And like to meet the dude that did it was just like, oh shit, you know, like, <laughs> he's here. <laughs> he's, you're the dude that does that giant, you know, beautiful yeah. work. It's crazy. Looking back bro, at your journey, is there anything you would say you regret doing or not doing? Ooh, regrets. I don't live with regrets. Okay. Honestly, like I, I see everything as a learning experience. Yeah. So, no. no i mean I, I did what i did and i did it for the reasons i did it and it made me the person i am and that's i just accept it as that well, what would you say to that to that new upcoming guy that would see this episode and be like inspired by me and he wants to start painting do it paint <laughs> get out there and do it and like do it as much as you can like don't let anybody stop you don't you know don't play by the rules, do your own thing. Like people respect creativity and like, of course you're going to be inspired, be inspired. Yeah. But you know, be you if, as much as possible. What can the audience and viewers expect from Meeks in the future? Oh man, <laughs> that's so hard to say. <laughs> I mean, I see myself retiring, you know, like just like painting canvases. I really love to like do still life stuff of city yeah. cityscapes and like, city scenes and stuff like that like i like to just hang out with my easel and yeah like in the middle of the city and have people talk to me while i'm painting and yeah i enjoy that like interact Definitely. with people in my environment um but as um, far as retiring you think you would you would give it up completely 100 percent? oh no no retiring in the way of just like <laughs> just being an old man with a canvas <laughs> painting i'll I, tell you what back in 85 back in my day <laughs> yeah 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 no i mean like it's it's always going to be a part of me yeah graffiti is always going to be a part of me there's no there's no i don't see life without it in any you know in some way it's always going to be a part of me do you still keep your out your eye out today for the current graffiti while you're driving around 100 percent. is there anything that has caught your attention uh hopes 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 is killing it but the rollers oh man he's like taking it to new levels like that <laughs> that kid man, so much respect for you hope shout out hopes yeah, he's definitely putting doing it down. definitely doing his thing. Putting it down. Um ooh, as far as standouts, <sighs> there's so many people right now, man. It's hard <laughs> to say. What do you think about those guys that are hanging from the rooftops like ninjas? That shit is crazy. Have you seen that? That's amazing. Repelling I, down. I think one of them shouts MSK, man. You guys are murdering. One of them is Rams, and I forget the other name. Shout out to those guys taking it to the next level. Mad Society Kings, dude. Alive forever. It's crazy. It's respect. Big, yeah. big, big they, respect. They keep growing and keep pushing limits. Absolutely. Is there anybody out there you want to give a shout out to, brother? Oh, man. There's so many people. Like, I'd say, like, DJ Wobbles, uh, DJ Drez, June 22, all my Coos family. Love you forever. Um, let's see. Uh, Posh, of course. My man Posh, Olay, Jolt, even you. Love you, buddy. <laughs> 
I got one last question for you before we get on oh, that here, brother. One more. Sorry, sorry. I got one more. Yeah. Dove Fear DCV. Shout Def out Dove and Fear, man. Def Crown. Shout out Fear. We've had him on here. Last question for you before we get out here, brother. What do you want Meeks to? What do you want people to remember Meeks by? After Meeks is no longer here, I'm no longer here, and it's a new generation in the I, future. I just hope that like people, if they reflect on me, reflect on me happily, and they were inspired, and I made them happy in some way. Yeah. And that, like, I don't know, man, just continue that energy, that vibe of, like, experiment, be creative, like, take it all in, man. You got a short period of time to do it, do it. Definitely. Again, I want to give you a special thank you for coming in here today and talking about your graffiti history and give me the opportunity to dig a little bit in there. And make sure to like and subscribe. Also, make sure to check out our website, gotnocontrol.com. Check out our merch. We have sweaters, shirts, and so much more. So make sure you give it a, a shot. Until next time, we're out. Peace. Peace.